Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Carl Berm Complete Decca and Phillips Recordings, another big bad box full of, oh gosh, how many CDs have we got here? Uh, 27 through 38 or so, plus a DVD, a bonus DVD. Does it say how many CDs it has? Not really, but uh, I will figure, oh, wait a minute, there it is. Yes, 30, 38 CDs. That's what it is. And it's one of these, be careful or you're going to kill yourself. When you try and get it off here, it falls up like that. And inside you see these things. And they're, I mean, it's nicely packaged, but I can't stand these things with these these giganto like lid things because they, they provide an extra layer of insulation against uh, the box itself. But you may kill yourself when you take it down from a shelf or the whole thing drops out and falls on your foot. So, or whatever it falls onto. So anyway, there he is, Carl Boehm. Now, as you know, most of what he did was on Deutsche Grammophone. Um, at least later in his career. And although there has been an EMI box and where there were some select things, and there's a big Deutsche Grammophone box coming very, very shortly, which we'll be talking about. And they've already done the complete Deutsche Grammophone opera box. So there's just a lot of boom stuff out there. There have been a lot of boom boxes. Get it? A boom box. Ha ha! No, okay, never mind. Um, I'm going to go buy the book this time instead of the actual discs because it just doesn't help. Are these? They're kind of original, original jackets. Um, it looks like some of these are. Yes, they are original jackets. Here, I'll show you an original jacket. There you go. It's a jacket. It's original. Um, so you know, if you care about such things, I got to tell you, I, I don't know who wants those things. I mean, I don't know. It, it just isn't important to me. However. Let's uh, see what we got in here. Most of this stuff is mono. It really is. It's all it's all done. It's the immediate post-war period, well, or the 50s, you know, and up into the early 60s. And then he switched to DG and redid everything that's in here all over again, basically. So, you know, there's there's very little here that you can't get elsewhere in stereo. And his interpretations did not change that much over time. Only at the very, very end of his life when he really started to slow down because he was, you know, getting old and decrepit. But non-decrepit Berm was pretty much consistent all the way through. So it, it doesn't really matter which one you get. And that's the problem with this box. I'll, be, I'll come straight out and say it. There's just a ton of duplicated stuff that you can get in better sound, in stereo, and the orchestras were better too in the 60s. So, mm, so let's see what we got. All right, we get uh, Mozart symphonies. You get a whole bunch of Mozart symphonies. We get the, let's see, 34, 36, and 38 with the Vienna Philharmonic. This is from 51 in mono. I mean, the Vienna Philharmonic was in a rebuilding phase back then. They weren't so great. The sound isn't so great. It's not terrible, but, and Brehm was such a great Mozartian, but he redid all this stuff. So do you need that? No, that goes in the no column. Mozart Requiem. Well, you might want you might want to hear it for the soloist, Teresa Stick Randall, um, Ira Melaniuk, Waldemar Kment, and Kurt Böhme. Um, this is with the Vienna Symphony, and that's not even as interesting as the Philharmonic. And then we get Mozart Symphonies uh, 26, yes, and 32, which is the overture in G. And these were on Philips, and they were recorded around 56 or so. Um, the Mozart Symphonies, however, are with the Concertgebouw. And the Concertgebouw in the 50s was an orchestra of considerable interest. You may recall Bynum was in charge back then in the post-war period after they tossed Mengelberg for his Nazi sympathies. And, uh, and Bynum was fabulous conductor and the orchestra was very, very interesting and had a lot of those special qualities that sort of evaporated over the 70s and 80s. So it's always interesting to hear the Kitzerkebel for itself. It doesn't even matter who's conducting it. And then we get, let's see, oh, the famous Mozart 27th Piano Concerto with Wilhelm Backhaus in the Vienna Phil and the Beethoven Choral Fantasy with Hans Richter Hasser and Teresa Stitch Randall and Judith Helwig and Hildy Russell Maiden and Anton Dermata and a bunch of people um, with the Wiener Symphoniker. I mean, it's not terribly special. And then Mozart uh, 39, 40, and 41 with the Concertgebouw. Now, this is, again, it's worth hearing. 
It's mono, but it's boom, it's Mozart, it's Mozart's very good, the concerto bell's marvelous. You know, these things are worth having for, for collectors. Um, so, you know, that's that's the key in the keeper column, that one. Uh, Beethoven, piano concertos one and three, with Friedrich Gulde in one, and Wilhelm Backhaus in three, with the Vienna Phil. I mean, these are, these are, of course, going to appeal not for Böhm, but for the soloists, and they appear in the boxes dedicated to those soloists. So if you have the Backhaus box or if you have the Gulde box, you're already going to have these, and you may not need them again. Beethoven 8, Schubert 5, and Schubert 8, the unfinished. Very good unfinished. It really is. This is with the Vienna Phil, and again, these are all mono. The Beethoven is, is, is also pretty, you know, well... It, Berm wasn't known for his sense of humor, but um, it's a pretty sturdy Beethoven 8th. The Schubert 5 is beautiful, but the unfinished is really kind of special. It's very good unfinished. Um, strangely, strangely, strangely uh, ferocious, maybe is the word. I don't know. Then we have a Beethoven 9 with the Vienna Symphoniker, the Wiener Symphoniker, and the Vienna State Opera Chorus. And... It, yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's the same interpretation that you get in the first stereo DG Brum Vienna Phil Beethoven knife, not the late one that he made after he was dead. But I mean, the one that was made before he was dead. And, and it's, it's a great ninth. It's one of the great ninths. I mean, the interpretation, again, is the same, but boy, it doesn't sound very good. And, and it, it just got better and much better. So we don't need that ninth. The Brahms Piano Concerto Number One with Backhaus, that's famous. Um, some people love it. Some people think it's just stiff and horrible. Um, I, th I kind of like it. It's sort of heavy-duty German. But that's what they were, heavy-duty Germans. And then we get uh, the Piano Concerto Number Two. Oh, this is also with Backhaus. So that's good. That was much later, 67, when Backhaus was kind of like sort of toward the end of his career. And uh, well, you know, again, it's for Backhaus fans. Then we have, you know, I cannot do a talk in this bleeping city without there being a siren going by. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, there he goes. Okay, it went. Brahms Third Symphony and Weber Opera Overtures. This is a nice record with the Vienna Phil. You know, Berm, I found his Brahms a little stodgy, but he got the third. Unlike so many people who do great Brahms, but blow the third. He got the third. This is an exciting third. It's really, really good. No exposition repeat in the first movement, of course, but what the hey? It's really terrific. It's mono. But uh, he he gets it. What can I say? He gets it. Oh, yes. Famous, famous, essential now. The third and fourth symphonies of our dear friend Anton Bruckner. <laughs> And uh, these are famous recordings. They have been since the day they came out. They are absolutely marvelous, splendid, fabulous, iconic recordings of those two works. And, and they remain so. And they've been reissued a million times, and you probably already have them. But if you don't, they're in here. And now we're going to start getting to some vocal stuff. We're only on CD, uh, let's see, CD 13. Uh, the Strauss Four Last Songs with Lisa Della Casa, famous and quick. Interesting because they don't dawdle. You know, the tendency since, these, you know, remember, these were new works back in those days. You know, the tendency since then is to play them slower and slower and slower, and they're gorgeous. You know, let's not be snooty about it. I mean, to hear Jesse Norman do it and take 20 minutes longer than anyone else is just fabulous. Fabulous. But but originally they were not meant to go that slow. And this is this is a lovely performance, famous performance. Then we get Death and Transfiguration with the Kitzirchabal. Um, it sounds like Death and Transfiguration. It's good, nobody needs it, I mean, frankly. And then there's all kinds of Mozart and arias and other arias and things with, with different singers. You get Paul Schiffler, you get Julius Patzak, we all know him, from the famous Patzak Ferrier, Das Lied von der Erde. Um, and let's see, Anton der, der Malta, and they're doing they're doing arias by Mozart, Strauss, and songs. Schumann, Hugo Wolf, Verdi, Wagner, Beethoven, you know, all those people who wrote arias. We don't have to go through them and see which one they are. Then we get the complete aria, the complete operas, all of which Brum remade in stereo. Some of these are in stereo, but it's okay. Let's see what's really important: Magic Flute. 
Die Zauberflöte. With, 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 let's see, who we got with Kurt Berman, Leopold Simino. Oh, he's really good in this. This is a really great Simino, Simino performance. Paul Schiffler, Vilma Lip, Hilda Gooden, Crystal Ludwig is, is the second lady. Walter Berry is Papageno. You know, Emmy Luce is Papageno. This is fun. First of all, you know, these, these opera recordings from the 50s are important because of the ensemble, the Vienna state opera ensemble of singers who worked, they, they appear in the Eric Kleiber stuff, they appear in basically in all this stuff, but, but it, was, it was a moment. It was a historical moment when there was a tremendous company to do this, the, the basic German standard repertoire plus Mozart, who was of course German, but you know, the operas are in Italian. It, it really was a, a terrific moment vocally. And so for, though, for that reason, the operas are worth having. Now, Carl, Carl Böhm was a wonderful conductor, a real man of the theater. He always keeps things moving. The performances are are sensitive and and just really good. I mean, good, solid theatrical conducting. And that doesn't draw attention to itself. See, that really lets the singer sing. And so I like these performances. Um, but again, he remade some of them. Some of them are better, some of them are worse. It, it doesn't really matter. In that sense, I, I think if you're an opera person, first of all, you're going to want these. And second of all, uh, they're, they're really good. Most of them are really good ensemble performances. So we get the magic flute. I really like Simino as Tamino. He's very, very good in this. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I'm not a magic flute person because the plot is just insufferable. But, you know, the music is gorgeous, and so we all put up with it, don't we? Uh, okay, then we have The Marriage of Figaro with uh, Paul Scheffler and Sena Uranats and Rita Streich and Walter Berry and Crystal Ludwig as Carabino, very young Crystal Ludwig, and Ira Milaniuk and, and like famous people like that. Marie Dickey is in this one as Don Curzio. You know Marie Dickey. He sings the tenor part in the Paul Kletzky Das Lied von der Erde. So, I mean, it's good to hear him. And this is with the Wiener Symphoniker, not the Philharmonic, but it, it's okay. It's like the same group of people anyway, so it doesn't matter. And let's see what we get next. Oh, let's see, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, Act 6, Act 9, uh, 1, 2, Act 3, Act 4, yes, Act 4. And then we get Cosi Fan Tutti. Now, Boom was one of the great Cosi Fan Tutists. Really, it was an opera. It's very funny because, again, he wasn't a guy known for his sense of humor, but he had that certain, you know, sardonic German cynicism. Klemperer had it, too. You know, behind the crusty old kraut exterior, there was somebody who could, like, crack a smile, especially when someone is being humiliated. There is nothing like a public humiliation to get these cranky old German people to grin. And, and Cosi Fantuti is all about humiliation. <laughs> And so he always did a great Cosi Fan Tutti. I mean, the EMI stereo one, of course, is famous. All of them have standard cuts, by the way. All of these performances, you're not going to find them, you know, you know, or text note complete, but it doesn't matter. And we've got, as Fior de Ligi, Lisa de la Casa, and Dorabella as Krista Ludwig. And, you know, I mean, this is, and, and Eric Kunz is Guglielmo, and Ferrando is, is Anton Dermata, and Emmy Luce is Despina, and Paul Schiffler is Don Alfonso. It's a wonderful cast. It's a Vienna Phil, and this is the first stereo release. So what the heck? Go for it. I mean, it's just it's just wonderful. And um, I, I mean, really, Brum's Cozy was special. It really was. It was one of the pieces that was sort of proprietary to him. And then we get a flater mouse. Oh, who's doing the flater mouse? Oh, it's another Vienna flater mouse. You know, then there was the Carion flater mouse and with the gala, you know, so and then Carlos Kleiber did it. And they all do it in Vienna because no one cares about hearing it anywhere else. Um, Eberhard Vector, Gundel Janowitz, Eric Kunz, Wolfgang Wingas, and Waldemar Kment. I mean, these casts are wonderful. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's funny, you know, they sound like dream team lists today. But, you know, back in those days, if you just went to the opera, that's who you heard. That's who was there. And I think that's, that's just wonderful. Strauss. Ah, this is a biggie. 
This is a real biggie. This is Die Frau ohne Schatten. This is the famous, famous recording. It wasn't issued for like a decade after they made it because no one thought it would sell. And and the, the singers you know, worked for free. And everybody did it because they just thought it was important to preserve the interpretation. It's an early stereo. It sounds just terrific. Actually, it sounds better than a lot of the later stereo ones. Um, yeah, it was first issued in 68, but it was recorded in 55. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it's it's just it's just wonderful. It's very, very extensively cut. Not as much as he later would cut it. But it's it's uh, such a great opera. I mean it's Strauss's greatest opera. Let's not let's not kid ourselves. And and it really and Brun was the guy who who put it on the map. So we've got, let's see, Hans Hopf, Leonie Riesenek as as the princess, and Elizabeth Herngen as the nurse, and Kurt Burma and Emmy Luce. And let's see who's 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 uh, the the vibe, the the the, the Farberin or whatever they're called. Hutter der Barak oh Barak is Paul Schiffler. Yes, and the wife Crystal Goltz, Crystal Goltz, you know one of those German Kunst diva types who could screech with the best of them. The voice wasn't beautiful, but it was loud. Oh my! So that's really fun with the Vienna Phil. I, it's a wonderful performance, just lovable beyond belief. And then this whole big box ends with, oh, let's see what else we got here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me just check. What's this? No, this is still Frau. Okay, let's get rid of the Frau. Okay. And it ends with, it ends here with the ring. The Berm Ring, which was originally on Phillips, but which has been reissued 435 billion, trillion, zillion, quintillion times. And that really is kind of like, you know, I have it in 20 different incarnations. I, I, I think this is just stuffed in there. Well, I mean, it belongs in there, but who doesn't have it by now? It was in the Bayreuth box. It was in a separate budgie box. It was in a slightly less budgie box, moderate priced box. It, it's one of the great rings. I actually like it better than the Schulte ring. It's sort of the same cast. It's Birgit Nielsen and James King, Wolfgang Vingassen and James King. Is he in it? I, I, you know, all the, all the ring people who later did it for Decca uh, and Schulte. But they're here and they're live. And Leni Riesenek, of course, you get her Sieglinde, which is, you know, the one with the post-coital scream when she pulls the sword out of the tree. And, oh, it's just great. You know, the orchestra is the Bayreuth Festival Orchestra. It's good stereo sound. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful, exciting, take no prisoners ring. It's not a philosophical treatise. It's not a statement of egomaniacal conducting a la Carion, gorgeous though it is. It's, it's really terrific. So, if you don't have the Burm ring, I can't imagine um, anyone who doesn't have it, but it's in here. And you also get a Blu-ray version of it. Yay! If you're a Blu-ray Blu Blu player. So you can sit there on your butt and listen to the whole thing in a sitting without ever getting up. I mean, you may need, you know, to have an ambulance called after that, but who knows. So that's the boom box. It's really kind of strange. It has sort of a, 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 a schizoid personality because most of the orchestral stuff is not terribly interesting, with the exception of those two symphonies, the two the two Bruckner <laughs> symphonies, and the others. The rest of it you can you can live without, honestly. But the opera stuff is sui generis because not because of Boom, but because of the casts, because of the singers, and I think Boom probably would have wanted it that way. Quite frankly, the only really distinctive opera among all of these that Boom didn't do later, better or similarly, or whatever, or I say did better with a different cast, is Die Frau und Schatten, which is absolutely a classic and really ought to be issued separately and always be available separately, as it was at one point. And the ring is the ring. It probably you can find it a hundred different ways. So that's the Boom box. Let me let me reassemble it here. I'm going to reassemble it here. Give me a second. And, uh, you know, and the Schubert Unfinished. Yeah, that was really good, too. But here it is. If you're collecting Carl Boehm, you'll want this. Um, if you're an opera person, you'll want this. But if you're in, in it for the orchestral music, 
just the orchestra, basically the orchestra music, the symphonies and stuff like that, you don't need it. There's no question that you don't need it because you're going to get all of it all over again when the stereo bomb DG box comes out. And there's no reason to have it twice. There really isn't. And that's, that's my best feeling about it. Get it for the operas if you don't have them. If you have most of the operas, you know, it's another big box. What are you going to do? Keep on listening. That's what we're going to do. Thank you for joining me. Take care.